Good evening everyone. I hope these Tuesday evenings and a little series called Back to Basics to refresh our memories of some of the things, some of the rituals, some of the ideas, some of the theology that we use, that we operate, that we celebrate as a church community. I don't mean any of it to treat you badly but just simply to renew our appreciation of some things that over the years might have become rusty or we've forgotten just to familiarise ourselves again with cer certain customs in our community. So we are in the sacristy of Sacred Heart Church this evening and I'm about to get vested uh, for Mass. We are going to take a wee look at the first part of the Eucharistic celebration, the liturgy of the Word. Because as you know, Mass is split into two parts. It's a game of two halves, if you like. The liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the Eucharist. And so now, the priest would be vested with this first vestment called the Alb, which will be very familiar to you all because you would see that deacons, bishops, Everyone really wears this vestment because really it's a vestment that symbolises the fact that we are baptised, which is why servers would normally wear an alb because that's the way they live out their baptism, by their ministry as server. Also, when children are baptised, they are covered in a white baptismal garment like the alb. When adults are baptised, they would be vested in an alb like this. When you're dead, your coffin is covered in a white garment, symbolic of the alb. When you're married, your dress would be white. When you make the First Communion, your dress would be white. Everything refers back to the basic sacrament of baptism, the sacrament that unites us as the people of God. As a priest then, I would wear this called a stole, which is really a symbol of my office as priest. Kenny, you would sometimes see a deacon wears a stole from that side to that side to symbolise that he is a deacon and not a priest. And then the chasuble, this outward garment, um, which is very akin to the garments that Romans would have wore many, many years ago. And as you know, we wear these for different occasions and in different colours. Green for the ordinary time of the year. Purple, two purples here, which speak of preparation. A very dark purple for Lent. A lighter purple for the preparation of Advent. And red for blood and for the Holy Spirit. So for martyrs and for the Spirit, we would wear red. And for any celebration, for joyful celebrations, we would wear white, as we do at this moment in time as we are celebrating Easter Tide. And now with me, I would like you to come into our church to go through the beginning, the beginning rites of our Eucharist. As the priest would approach the altar, he would bow to the altar table, the primary celebration or the primary sign of Christ in the midst of the community. Even before the Blessed Sacrament, Christ is present in the gathering of the community. There's no Blessed Sacrament without the altar, and so we honour and venerate the altar as the primary sign of Christ's presence in our community. in each altar and within there is some relic of some saint and that goes back to the day of the catacombs 
when it was illegal to practice our faith in public, and so Christians would gather for the celebration of Mass deep under the streets of Rome and the catacombs. And in the catacombs, in the walls would be hollowed out sepulchres for the bodies of the early martyrs to be placed. And eventually they were overlaid with marble with their names on it. And maybe on that person's anniversary of death, the community would gather for Mass. And as a sign of love and respect, they would kiss that marble, kiss and honour the martyr who was buried there. And so this goes back to that day. It's not just about the veneration of the altar. It's a reminder of our past. A reminder of the saints who have given their lives for our community and for the faith. It's a way of honouring their memory. After having venerated the altar by a bow and a kiss, then the celebrant would move to the chair. The chair would be the presider's chair, and from it he should be able to see the whole community, and more importantly, the community should be able to see him. I said that the Mass was a game of two halves, the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist, but both halves are, have appendages, if you like. Before the Liturgy of the Word, there's the introductory rites, and after the Liturgy of the Eucharist, there's a concluding rite. And so, the introductory rites prepare us to celebrate God's Word, and they consist of as follows. We mark ourselves out as the baptised, as belonging to God in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. To prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries that has called to mind our sins. You are sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. You came to be friends with sinners. Christ have mercy. You speak up for us in the presence of our Heavenly Father. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. O God, you have bestowed upon us pastoral remedies. Fill your people with heavenly gifts, so that, possessed of perfect freedom, we may rejoice in heaven over the God gladdens us now here on earth. And we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Those would normally be the introductory rites to prepare us, to recollect us before hearing the word of God. But a wee word about them. Normally, we would have an entrance in, a gathering him to gather us in as a community. Because you know it can be very fraught, fretful getting everyone out to Mass, say, on a Sunday morning. So we have to have a way of moving from being a crowd of individuals who just happen to be gathering in the one building to being the people of God able to offer up worship to Almighty God. And so a gathering him brings us all together, as does those reflective rites that maybe helps us think of how we could have done better just to calm us down. Sometimes we also have the Gloria Sun, if it's a very special occasion, like just now during Easter Pride, we would sing the praises of the Trinity because of the glory of the Resurrection that we are presently celebrating. So these rites are just to knit us together as one into being a worshipping and a receptive community. Receptive, of course, to listening to the Word of God. As Christians, we believe that particularly in the assembly, that God speaks to us through the Word. That's why also, and this is important, it's not just an architectural thing, but in this church, in this day chapel, there's a similarity between 
the lectern, the anvil, or the pulpit, whatever you like to call it, and the altar. <clears throat> and that's what the church asks, because it speaks of the table of God's Word and the table of the Eucharist, and it equates them. The both should be seen as equally sacred, because God speaks in His Word, and God gifts Himself in the Eucharist. And the places of celebration should be respected as two very equal and similar places of celebration. We should respect God's presence in the world as much as we respect God's presence in the sacrament of the Eucharist. Normally, on a Sunday, there would be three readings from Scripture. <clears throat> and the way that's arranged is as follows. We work a three-year cycle of the four Gospels. We would have Matthew's year, Mark's year, Luke's year. And interspersed between them on big feast days would be the reading of the Gospel of John. And because Mark is the shortest Gospel, then usually during the summer period, we would have readings for about six weeks from the Bread of Life discourse from John. So basically in three years, we have read through the majority of the four Gospels. So the Gospels would be read in a cycle of three years, Matthew, Mark and Luke, and John added in. The first reading then is chosen to from the Gospel each week. So we look at the Gospel first and then look at an Old Testament that corresponds with that Gospel reading. The second reading, which are usually from the letters of St Paul or Philemon or James or whoever, they are just read continuously each year. They just go through Paul's writings or the New Testament readings continuously. They're not linked to the Gospel or the first reading at all. They are stand alone and just read continuously till we get to the end of them. So we have normally an Old Testament reading, except during Easter time, where the first reading would always be from the Acts of the Apostles, to we look at how the early church began after the resurrection of the Lord. So you would have our first reading, then respond to that reading with one of the Psalms. There are 150 Psalms. And that psalm would be chosen to fit in with the first reading. Then the reading from St Paul or James or Philemon or whoever. And then the Gospel reading. And the Gospel reading, because it's the word of Jesus himself, would be preceded by the Gospel acclamation, where everyone would be asked to stand in recognition that these are Jesus' own words. Normally, the servers would bring candles and incense to show that this is something really important that's about to happen, that the Lord himself speaks to us through his work, speaks to us in the assembly. And so the gospel reading then would be accompanied by the deacon with the gospel book, with the words of the gospel in it, the procession, the candles, the incense, the singing. Impressive, impressive because it's the work of Jesus himself. After the Gospel reading, there should always be a homily. And a homily should always try to unpick the Scriptures to help the people in the church understand something of God's love for us. The church does tell us that sometime the homily should be concerned with the rubrics of the Mass and the celebration of Mass as we are doing right at this moment to help deepen our understanding of what we celebrate. But mostly, it should always be something to help people connect their faith lives with the Scriptures. For me personally, I'd just say a word about how I prepare a homily, what I try to do, and I don't always succeed, but it's what I try to do. And that is that I would take the Gospel, I would look at it, and I would see what it meant for me personally. 
And then I would ask myself in prayer what I think that means for you. And when I have that one single thought, then I would try to find an example from my life or a funny story or an event that happened to me or something that happened in the family, something that I hope that you could easily tap into so that you would be together, would understand the teaching of the gospel better and then I would find a way of trying to apply that to our lives. So as well as preaching to you, I would be preaching to me and I would try to do that in three parts and that would be an example from daily life or a funny story, the point from the gospel and how it applies to our daily lives. I don't always make it, but I do try my best. After the homily, there would be the creed on a Sunday where we would profess faith together. Normally, it would be the Nicene Creed, and in this time of Easter time, we would have opted to use the Apostles' Creed because the Apostles' Creed is really, or the baptismal promises that we have renewed on Easter day are based on the Apostles' Creed, and so it's much more of an Eastery feel about it. So normally during Easter time, we would use the Apostles' Creed and the rest of the year, the Nicene Creed. Having professed faith together then, we would have the bidding prayers, which are called the prayer of the faithful, where we would try to gather the prayers of everyone, the, the needs, the prayerful needs of the community. When I was younger, Father Tolan used to insist that the people themselves wrote those prayers because it was the prayer of the faithful, that they shouldn't be stylized in any way that it should be real prayers that come from the body of the kirk, if you like. But even although they are the prayer of the faithful, there, there, there is a structure to them. And that structure should be to look, first of all, at the needs of the universal church, and then to look at the needs of government or local authorities or whoever, and then local needs and then personal needs. So there is a kind of structure to it. And lastly, the prayer for the dead and those we have lost. So there is a kind of structure not to contain the prayers, but to make sure that they're not just our prayer, that they are a universal prayer, that we remember the world, the needs of the world, the needs of the church, and the needs beyond our own gathering, our own parish, our own community, that we pray for others. So the prayer of the faithful, should be ours, it should be important to us, but it should open us out to other people. And so with the prayer of the faithful, we come to the conclusion then of the liturgy of the Word. And that liturgy then should prepare us to celebrate the liturgy of the Eucharist, which we will look at in some detail next week. Having said that, this is one way that you could think of the liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the Eucharist. That in the liturgy of the Word, God speaks to us through His Word and we respond to Him. So, God speaks through the words of the first reading, we respond in the psalm. God speaks through the second reading and we respond in the Alleluia. God speaks through the Gospel and we respond by professing our faith and by praying to Him and praising Him. Liturgy is always about that interplay between ourselves and God because it's about relationship, the relationship between ourselves and God, the relationship where God speaks to us and we respond in love. Thank you.